Lecture 9-1. Money, Banking, and the Money Supply. What's money? Sure, we use it every day, and we'd always like to have more of it, but we don't often have occasion to think about it in economic terms, and that's the subject of this lecture. Economists realize that the most important thing about money is that it reduces the costs of exchange. Since exchange in markets is one of the institutional features of wealth-producing economies, things that make exchange easier contribute to the production of wealth and to the reduction of poverty. How does money reduce the transaction cost of exchange? Well, we can answer that question by first defining money and then identifying the functions it performs. A simple but useful definition is that Money is anything generally accepted in exchange for goods and services. The anything part of that definition has included a wide range of commodities throughout history. Cattle and salt in the ancient world, shell necklaces among Native Americans, tobacco in colonial America, giant stones on the island of Yap, chocolate and cigarettes in World War II prison camps, and, of course, gold in any number of societies. The commodities themselves, salt, cows, tobacco, had value, and they became money because of physical characteristics like durability, transportability, and ease of measurement. But more importantly, whatever commodity became money had to perform three functions in order to be, quote, generally accepted in exchange for goods and services. First, whatever we choose as money must act as a medium of exchange. The gas station, the coffee shop, and the cable guy all must accept it in return for their goods and services. Second, money is a standard of value. We could exchange without money by bartering for goods and services, but think how costly it is to establish the comparable values of the things we want to trade. How many cows are worth a shirt? How many hours of music lessons are worth a computer? Barter's a hassle. In economic terms, the translation for hassle is it has high transaction costs. Using money reduces those transaction costs. If cows, shirts, music lessons, and computers are all valued in standard money terms, the exchanges are easier and more exchanges are likely to take place. And that's our goal, right? Third, money is a store of value. An apple grower creates value in a crop of apples, but apples don't store well. Imagine storing enough apples to purchase a car. By the time you're ready to buy the car, most of your value has rotted away. By selling the apples for money, a farmer translates their value into a form that can be easily stored. Most civilizations moved beyond cows and salt a long time ago, but many people don't realize that we've even moved beyond gold. With minor exceptions, commodity money is a thing of the past, and today we use fiat money. The source of value for our currency and checks isn't the commodity, the paper. The value is established by fiat, or decree of the government. Our money has value because the government's decreed that it's money and will be accepted not only by the department store, the barista, and the cable guy, but also by Uncle Sam in payment of your taxes. Fiat money is like commodity money, however, in that it must perform all three functions, a medium of exchange, a standard of value, and a store of value, in order to be viable. When asked to show you some American money today, most people would pull some bills and coins out of their pocket. And they're right, cash is money. But they'd probably be surprised to learn that it actually makes up only a very small portion of our country's total money supply. M1 is the Federal Reserve System's basic measurement of the money supply. It measures the everyday money that we use in exchange for goods and services. Now, notice that currency and coins in circulation are part of M1. But the biggest part is demand deposits, which is banker speak for checking accounts. Less than a third of M1 is held in the form of cash. Most is held in the form of checking accounts. 
Bankers describe them as demand deposits because the depositor can withdraw or use the money without prior notification of the bank, on demand, as the name says. We use our demand deposits as money when we pay for something with a check, either paper or electronic, or with a debit card. Now just a note here, credit cards aren't demand deposits, only debit cards. Debit cards transfer money from your bank account to the sellers when you make a purchase. Credit cards are essentially a loan that you pay off at the end of the month. So think about that. Checking accounts are actually money. Yes, they are. They're generally accepted in exchange for goods and services. And they make up the bulk of the total U.S. money supply, which in the spring of 2011 was over $1 trillion $850 billion. The Federal Reserve System reports the money supply monthly, and you can check the current figures by going to www.federalreserve.org and clicking on the Statistical Releases link. So, where did we get almost $2 trillion? Most people have probably never even thought about how money's created, and those who have are remembering their grade school tours of the Mint or the Bureau of Printing and Engraving, so they have mental images of printing presses and coin stamps running non-stop since 1787. Presenting them with the fact that most money isn't currency will probably get you some pretty inventive answer to the question of where it does come from. The short answer is that money is created through commercial banking. The historical story of money and banking is actually surprisingly interesting. The first bankers didn't walk around in pinstripe suits with briefcases or even have fortified buildings and teller windows with iron bars. They were blacksmiths, or more accurately, goldsmiths. These artisans fashioned gold into jewelry or coins or other artifacts of wealth and they had to be able to store and protect the gold brought to them by their customers. Some were big burly guys. The story goes that they hid the gold under the anvil, which no one else was strong enough to move. Or people built strong safes, hired guards, or took whatever measures were necessary to ensure the safety of the gold in their keeping. Eventually, even people who weren't buying things from the goldsmith realized that this was a good, safe place to store their gold. So instead of keeping it themselves where it could be lost or stolen, they would deposit it with the goldsmith and pay him a small fee for keeping it safe. He, in turn, would give them a receipt or an IOU as evidence of the deposit. When people wanted their gold to spend, they got it by going back to the goldsmith and turning in their receipts. Now, say that a depositor wanted to purchase what, a, a new carriage. He'd take the gold to the carriage maker in payment. But then, the carriage maker would have the same problem, where to store the gold to keep it safe. So, he took it to the goldsmith, deposited it again, and got a receipt. Hopefully, you've realized that there's an easier way to handle this, and it soon became the standard procedure. Instead of everyone making trips down to the goldsmith, taking out gold, depositing gold, and getting new receipts, people began to sign over their receipts, or portions of them, to the carriage maker, or barber, or merchant, or whoever. The carriage maker then had the receipt, giving him ownership of the gold, which all the time remained safely on deposit with the goldsmith. At this point, the receipts had become money. They fit our definition, don't they? anything generally accepted as payment for goods and services. To the extent that the receipts of a particular goldsmith were accepted throughout the community, they were money. Now, to begin with, this money, that is, the receipts, was fully backed by gold. Eventually, though, it occurred to some goldsmiths that as the receipts circulated and became accepted as currency, the gold itself might stay in their possession for a really long time. And they realized that people didn't know how much gold they had, and they didn't care, as long as they were confident that they could get their gold when they presented their receipts. So goldsmiths figured out that they could lend money to people by issuing a few extra receipts. 
as long as they didn't issue too many and always had enough gold on hand when depositors came in to redeem the receipts, everything was fine. The goldsmiths charged for making the loans and the borrowers were willing to pay for the convenience of making their purchases early, before their next crop was harvested, for example. In this way, the goldsmiths actually created more money. The money, that is the gold receipts, was not fully backed by gold anymore, but it still performed the functions of money and reduced the cost of exchange. My goldsmith story is essentially a simplified version of the history of fractional reserve or commercial banking, and the circulation of the gold receipts puts us closer to our modern form of money. Now, one major difference is that today we don't have any gold backing up our money. It's backed up by our faith and trust in the soundness of our government and our economy. But in terms of function, the currency we use is exactly like the goldsmith's receipts, because it's generally accepted, it's money. The connection between the goldsmiths and today's money supply is the creation of money by lending. Demand deposits are analogous to the gold receipts in that the owner of the receipt could demand his money at any time. Earlier, we defined the money supply of the United States as M1 as including all the coin and currency in circulation plus all the demand deposits. So think of the demand deposits as being like the gold receipts. Now people can choose to hold their money in cash or currency or in demand deposits. Some people like the feel of cash in their pockets, some like the convenience of checks. But clearly a single dollar of purchasing power can't be held in both check form and currency form at the same time. So when we calculate M1, we count only the currency and coin in circulation. If someone, a waiter let's say, deposits his cash tips into his checking account, the bank puts the cash in the vault and adds an electronic entry to his checking account. The waiters change the form in which he holds his money, from currency to a demand deposit, but he didn't change the amount. If we counted the currency he deposited, we'd be double counting, so we only count the demand deposit. Now later on, when other people come in and cash checks, some of that currency that was in the vault goes back into circulation and is then counted in the money supply. In many ways, the waiter's bank faces the same situation as the goldsmith. The waiter and other depositors are unlikely to all demand currency and empty their accounts at the same time, and the bank can issue a few extra receipts. Commercial banks can make loans and create purchasing power just as the goldsmith did. The vastly simplified answer to the question of how we ended up with a $2 trillion money supply then is through lending by commercial banks, not by running the printing presses nonstop. Here's how it works. Our waiter, John, has a pocket full of cash tips at the end of his shift. John's bank accepts his deposit and enters it into his checking account and gives him a receipt or a bank account statement which shows his increased purchasing power as a checking account balance. The money supply is $100. John has just changed the form in which he holds his money from cash to a demand deposit. John's bank, however, then lends half the amount of John's deposit to Sue. It could be that Sue gets the loan in currency, but it doesn't have to work that way, and most often it doesn't. More likely, the bank issues Sue a check, or if she already has an account in the bank, it simply adds the amount of loan to her demand deposit. As a result of the loan, Sue now has more purchasing power. The bank's just created money. Sue's purchasing power increased, but what happened to John's? Well, nothing. John's still happily running around writing checks on his checking account. Lending to Sue increased her purchasing power without reducing John's, and the money supply grew by the amount of Sue's loan. So then let's say that Sue deposits her loan in another bank, which then lends half the amount to Bill. The money supply has expanded again, all from John's original $100 deposit. 
Now, this may sound like a pretty shaky process if you're unfamiliar with it, but banks have competitors. They know that lending is risky. Entrepreneurs accept risk, remember? And they have to think carefully about how much money they're willing to lend. And although banks have a strong incentive to not overextend their loans, the Federal Reserve System also exerts control over how much of total deposits the banks may lend. In any case, the more loans that are made, the greater the expansion of the money supply. Okay, so expansion of the money supply occurs when banks make loans, but eventually the loans are paid off. What happens then? Well, it's the opposite of the borrowing process. Paying off loans reduces the money supply in much the same way that paying out loans increases it. Bill used his $25 loan to buy a round of golf, but he still has a liability to the bank. What does he pay it back with? He had to use other purchasing power, either income that he earned or something he received as a gift, for example. But when he pays back the loan, think of it as giving up some purchasing power, the money supply shrinks. Same thing happens when Sue pays off her loan. Now, laid out that way, the mechanics of expanding and contracting the money supply seem pretty straightforward. When banks make more loans, the money supply expands. When banks don't make as many new loans as old loans are being paid off, the money supply contracts. In the United States, the Federal Reserve System is responsible for controlling the money supply, that process of expansion and contraction. The Fed's an independent agency of the executive branch of the federal government, and it was created by Congress in 1913. It acts as the nation's central bank, heading up a system of 14 regional banks and controlling the money supply by overseeing the activities of the many thousands of affiliated commercial banks. The Federal Reserve System's regional banks differ from the banks you and I deal with in that they are banks for banks. We can't have accounts with the Fed but our banks can and probably do. Check yours out next time you visit. See if it has a, quote, member of the Federal Reserve System sign on the door. Now, don't panic if it doesn't, because some banks are members of state banking systems instead of of the Fed system. In addition to controlling the money supply and regulating banking practices, the Fed acts as a check clearing house for its member banks. Did you ever think about how the check you wrote for a sweater got from the store's bank back to yours so that your bank knew you spent the money? Most likely, it went through the Fed, where the store's bank's account was increased and your bank's account was decreased by the amount of your check. When your bank got notice of the decrease in its Fed account, it reduced your account balance by the amount of the check. This used to involve actual physical transfer of the checks, but today it's largely done electronically. While the day-to-day -day oversight of banking practices is important, the critical job assigned to the Fed is controlling the money supply. And it does this by using three tools, the reserve requirement, interest rates, and open market operations to manage the lending process. Remember that because it's unlikely that all depositors will want their deposits back at the same time, banks can lend some of the money they hold for depositors. Now, clearly it's not prudent for banks to lend all of their deposits, but on the other hand, there's no magic rule about how much is safe and how much is too much. Throughout history, and even today, some banks have learned that hard lesson by failing. Today, the Federal Reserve regulates how much banks may lend by specifying the percentage of deposits they may not lend. This percentage is called the required reserves. The amount banks are required to hold in reserve or keep on deposit with the Fed. Reserves above the required amount are called excess reserves and may be loaned at the bank's discretion. The higher the reserve requirement, the less the bank may lend and the less increase in the money supply. Conversely, the lower the reserve requirement, the more banks may lend and the greater the expansion of the money supply. Economists can calculate the potential expansion of the money supply fairly closely by knowing the reserve requirement and knowing the amount of deposits. 
Now, in theory, the Fed could change the reserve requirements for different types of deposits any time, but it doesn't. The reserve requirement tool is so powerful that sudden changes could have a devastating effect on the banking system and thus on the economy. Imagine what would happen if a bank had made all the loans for which it had reserves and then the Fed increased the reserve requirement. Where would the bank get the additional reserves it was required to have? Well, there are only two possibilities. One is to borrow from banks that have excess reserves. The second is to call in some loans, and that's a move not calculated to earn the bank much favor with its customers. Consequently, the reserve requirement is rarely changed. The second tool the Fed uses to change the money supply is its power over interest rates. Think of an interest rate as the price of money, a price that's generated by a market for money. The suppliers in this market are the lenders and indirectly the savers who deposited their money in the lenders' banks. The demanders are the borrowers. And the interaction of those supply and demand creates a price called an interest rate. Lots of things can impact the supply of and demand for loanable funds, and thus the interest rate. On the demand side, what are the other things that a borrower could do with his money if he didn't have to make interest payments? On the supply side, think of factors like the length and riskiness of loans. What's the likelihood that the lender can recover something of value if the borrower defaults? Those differences help to explain why mortgage interest rates are lower than credit card interest rates or used car loan rates, for example. As in other markets, the quantity demanded and quantity supplied of loanable funds are a function of price, in this case, the interest rate. Higher interest rates increase quantity supplied. Think of it as people's willingness to save and they reduce quantity demanded, people's willingness to borrow or take out a loan. Conversely, lower interest rates reduce people's willingness to save and increase borrowing. Because growth of the money supply is a function of lending, to the extent that the Fed can influence the interest rates then, it can influence the rate of growth of the money supply. Higher interest rates reduce borrowing and slow the growth of the money supply. Lower interest rates encourage borrowing and expands the money supply. The Fed itself has direct control over only one interest rate, the discount rate, at which it makes loans to banks that need to borrow reserves. In the course of day-to-day -day operations, some loans are paid off and new loans are made, but a bank must always maintain its required level of reserves to be in compliance with Fed regulations. One option for a bank that's not in compliance, say because it made many new loans on a day when few new deposits came in, is to borrow additional reserves from the Fed, for which it pays an interest rate called the discount rate. Other interest rates tend to rise and fall with the discount rate. So when the Fed eases or tightens the discount rate, it sends a signal to the banking system as a whole. And while it doesn't have direct control over those other interest rates, the Fed can target them through its open market operations, which is the third and most important tool for managing the money supply. Earlier, we suggested that the Fed rarely manipulated the reserve requirement, in part because it's a blunt tool with powerful impact. The interest rate, on the other hand, is the less reliable end of the scale. Interest rates are market signals. They can't force borrowers or lenders to act in any particular way. And putting pressure on interest rates works better at slowing borrowing down than it does at increasing borrowing. As you can imagine, raising interest rates is very likely to reduce customers' willingness to take out loans as they think about the opportunity cost. But falling rates don't guarantee that people will be more likely to borrow, especially in times of uncertainty. In that sense, then, interest rates are a more powerful tool in slowing the growth of the money supply than in stimulating it. 
While the reserve requirement and the discount rate get the most play in textbooks and news reports, the Fed actually uses open market operations to change the level of total reserves in the banking system on a daily basis in order to manage the money supply. Open market operations is the name given to the Fed's participation in the market for government securities. When Congress authorizes expenditures beyond the tax revenues of the federal government, the U.S. Treasury Department must fund that debt by issuing securities – Treasury notes, Treasury bonds, Treasury bills. People and companies who buy these securities are in effect lending their money to the government, which means they can't spend the money themselves. The reward they get for doing this is the interest they're paid when the bond or note comes due. The Federal Reserve System is one of the biggest players in this securities market, and by buying and selling the securities, it can affect the level of reserves in the banking system, which, you remember, is the key to growth of the money supply. So that if the Fed wants to shrink the money supply, it needs to reduce the reserves of member banks so that they can't lend as much. The Fed does this by offering to sell some of its Treasury securities. And these are very safe investments, by the way. The federal government has never defaulted on a debt, and so they're usually sold pretty rapidly. Commercial banks can choose to use their excess reserves to buy securities, and if they do, they have less left to lend and growth of the money supply is slowed. The Fed also sells securities to the public. If you take money out of the bank to buy a treasury note, then your bank has fewer deposits, fewer excess reserves, and can make fewer loans. Now, people can't spend treasury securities, so the money supply shrinks. It works the other way, too. If the Fed wants to expand the money supply, it goes into the open market and buys treasury bills or treasury notes from banks and from individuals. Think about what would happen in that transaction. If the Fed buys, then the Fed ends up with the piece of paper representing the security, and the money ends up in the bank's reserves or in the hands of a person who will deposit it in a bank. Either way, the reserves of the banking system are increased, interest rates are pushed lower – remember that we said earlier that open market operations can help the Fed to target interest rates – and the quantity of loans rises, increasing the money supply. So, when the Fed buys in the open market, it puts money in the hands of the public and it takes the treasury bonds and notes back into its own reserves. To put upward pressure on the interest rate, the Fed sells securities. The Fed ends up with the money, the buyers end up with the securities. This means that there's less money on deposit in the banks, so the supply of loanable funds declines. If the demand for loans stays the same and there's less money to lend, we can anticipate that the interest rate, the price of money, will rise. Reverse that whole operation and we'll see the price of money or interest rates fall. Okay, that's probably enough for now and so we'll stop here briefly. Please consult the lesson guide and then return for lecture 9-2 where we'll connect the mechanics of managing the money supply to the overall picture of economic growth and well-being.